It is a pleasure to host here Professor Ross Anderson from Cambridge University. Uh, he's working on various issues of security of cryptography. I have several papers with him, including uh, the design of certain. It was submitted as a candidate to the AES, several others as well. He was one of the first to study side channel attacks and uh, one of the first to study various other areas. He started various international workshops on cryptography, for example, but also on other related issues. His book, Security Engineering, is one of the most important books in this area that everybody follow and read. And he's working on uh, security in healthcare systems, on which we will talk today, but also on banking security and other related issues. So, as I said, it's a pleasure to, to have him here, Ross. Please. Thanks, Ali. Well, uh, for the first talk, Ali wanted something um, with um, broad appeal across subjects, and what I want to tell you over the next hour or so is that the safety and privacy of health systems is one of those subjects. It has enormous scope and it has great social importance and it's a subject that is going to be changing very rapidly over the next five to ten years. Now, Ellie kindly put me up at the Dan Carmel Hotel and this morning as I went to breakfast I found that the hotel has got a conference on medical equipment, right? And there's about 300 people there running around you know, trying to sell each other pumps, um, devices of various kinds. They should also be listening to this talk. But hey, you know, you heard it first. Oh, um, is that better? Okay, sorry, we had two microphones, one for the camera and, and one for the room. So what I'm basically going to talk about, are the, the thing that's changing the game is that health data are moving to the cloud and this is causing serious tussles over both safety and privacy. Safety perhaps comes first, and over the last three or four years we've begun to realize that safety usability failures are killing almost as many people in developed countries as road traffic accidents do. In the UK it's something like 2,000 a year. So I don't know what the figures are for Israel, perhaps they're not recorded, perhaps that's an interesting project for somebody to call up the hospitals and look at the statistics. Another problem is that as systems become centralized, if they become bought by health administrators rather than by doctors, the usability fails because the incentives start to be different. And one of the things that we understand in security engineering is that economics matters, right? The developers develop more than anything else for the man or for the woman who's got the checkbook. And when you move the locus of purchasing from the doctor's surgery or the hospital, to the Ministry of Health, then systems can change in strange ways. And also, as health information becomes centralized, it suddenly becomes economic for many people to demand access to the data. And this is causing serious privacy problems in Britain, the USA, Norway, Austria, and elsewhere. So how can you fix this? Well, it's not going to be purely a technical solution, and it's not going to be purely a political solution either but it's going to be a mixture of the two. That's what makes it both interesting and difficult. So the next three or four slides are slides that I've taken from my second year software engineering lectures where we teach undergraduates about safety critical systems. Um, how many of you have read Nancy Levison's book Safeware? No, it's not a textbook here. It's one of the textbooks we use in Cambridge. Nancy Levison is an aeronautics professor at MIT who investigated various failures, failures of aircraft software, but also the failure of this medical device in Canada 25 years ago. The Therac 25 was a medical accelerator which produced a beam of electrons, and this could be used either with a low beam current to treat surface lesions such as skin tumors, or with a high beam current um, with an X-ray target to produce X-rays for treating deeper tumors. And the safety requirement was that you should not fire the current, the full beam current, um, at naked flesh, 
right? The full beam current is only when you're using the target to generate x-rays. And so if you got the turntable out of alignment with the volume control on the beam current, you could kill people. In previous versions of this equipment, they had a physical safety interlock so that the switches which sensed the position of the platform would not allow full current to be used in the beam. Um, but in the uh, Model 25, they replaced this with software. And there were um, a number of software bugs which related to safety usability, which resulted in three people dying back in 1985, 1986. And this is the sort of screen you had. You had a screen where the um, operator could enter the various parameters, um, how much the beam current was to be, where the turntable was to be, the mode of operation, and so on. And the problem was that if the operator entered an edited beam type too quickly, there was a race condition which enabled that it could be reset again to a dangerous value. So this was a combination of poor software design and a complete failure in regulation, which resulted um, in a number of deaths and in this company being closed down. There are the details which we go into when I'm teaching this as a software engineering class. Basically, the code was like spaghetti, and there was a particular register called MIOS, where the data entry technique set this along with the turntable. Um, but um, um, MIOS could be edited again under some circumstances, which meant that you could end up with a dangerous combination. Now, you would think in a normal engineering discipline that people would learn from a terrible error like this. But if you look through the newspapers, you find that regularly, pretty well every year, there are fatal accidents with medical accelerators. So one way or another, the lesson of safe usability isn't internalized within the engineering community. And over the past three or four years, my colleague Harold Thimbleby at Swansea has been exploring this more systematically, and he's looked in particular at what happens with infusion pumps. Now, if you end up in hospital, you may end up on a drip, and there'll be a pump that may be administering some drug or another to you, and some of these drugs, um, painkillers, for example, can kill you if you get 10 times the appropriate dose. And similarly, if you get cancer and you get chemotherapy, again, these drugs are very toxic, and if you get an oral dose, they can kill you. Now, what Harold and his colleagues have found out is that the um, safety usability failures with infusion pumps are killing, on average, 10 people in every UK hospital every year. And in most cases, these are not lumped together and seen as a specific systemic problem. They are individually blamed on the carelessness of the nurse. That is the reaction of people in the medical business. You know, the doctor wrote that the dose should be 200 milligrams per hour, and somebody set 2,000 milligrams per hour, so that's not an engineering problem, but a disciplinary problem. But gradually, Harold is beginning to get people to see that there is a systemic problem here. All the different pumps, for example, have got different controls. And if you're, you're interested in vintage motor cars, you may know that some of the cars produced in the 1920s and 1930s uh, like the Armstrong Sidleys, for example, had a different layout of, of pedals. So you had the accelerator in the middle and the brake on the right and the clutch on the left. Now, if you climb into a car like that and try and drive it, hey, you're going to have trouble, right? The first few miles, you will be a hazard to everybody else on the road. And this is the problem that we are facing our doctors and nurses with uh, by getting them to use all sorts of different types of equipment with different user interfaces, and given that junior doctors and nurses typically change jobs every six months, that accounts for a significant part of the problem. But there are specific design problems too. For example, the most commonly used infusion pump in Britain, the Abbott, has got the feature that if you stop in the middle of entering data for three seconds, it resets itself silently to zero. So if you are trying to enter you know, 350 milligrams, for example, and you enter the three, and then you're distracted by somebody talking to you, and you continue entering five zero, then you'll end up with just 50 in the pump. And there's no alarm or anything like that. So there's really poor design. There's a regulatory problem, because everybody relies on the FDA in America to do the regulation here. The FDA have only two engineers, 
and they have to um, assess equipment entirely on written submissions from the vendors. They're not allowed to actually get an instance of the equipment and play with it. So there's an example of safety usability causing serious problems. So what can be done um, in general terms about healthcare IT? Well, one of the things that people have tried because of the many problems in, in, in the field is to say, can we make healthcare IT a consumer thing? Both Google and Microsoft had projects over the past five years to try and set up um, a centralized repository of health information into which everybody could plug and would provide a central and capable platform on which, for example, everyone could keep their medical records. So if you move from one place to a different place in the USA, you would no longer lose your records or have your doctor have to retype them. They would all just be there. We had something similar in the UK when there was a thing called Health Space was provided. Um, this was an attempt to provide a summary care record that would be accessible to everybody. Now, these, it turned out, didn't work. And what Google and Microsoft learned the hard way is that most people are not interested in their medical records because 95% of the time you're perfectly well and healthy and so there's no interest there. And the 5% of the time when you're sick, you've usually got other things to worry about than going to your computer and going guddling around trying to find information. So this has basically failed as an option. Another option that has been tried in some countries is central provision. And in Scotland, they had a system called GPASS. Now, GPASS was a GP's record system that was bought by the Department of Health in Scotland. Previously, GPs, when they wanted to computerize their practice, would, borrow, would, would buy a system from one of about 20 competing vendors. Uh, but then one of these vendors retired, and he sold his company to the Department of Health in Scotland. So they decided, fine, we will just make this uniform software that everybody will use, and we'll give it free to all doctors in Scotland. So that's um, something like 3,000 GPs for a population of 6,000 people, the same size of population as Israel. The problem with that was that within five years, lots and lots of doctors in Scotland were fed up with GPAS because it was no longer responsive to their needs and they were buying instead software using their own hard-earned cash from English vendors. And the reason was that the Scottish software was more and more geared towards the needs of administration. It was great at collecting statistical information from the centre, but supplying new features to support clinical care was always a low priority. So I, I went along to the uh, conference of one of the big um, English suppliers, EMIS, and um, that was an interesting thing to watch because we had a, a big conference in um, Hertfordshire in England. About 300 GPs were there who were all users of this software. One after another, a GP would stand up to give a paper saying, you know, we really need better systems for getting eye tests for our diabetics. And all the other GPs would go, yeah! And EMIS, the software developers, are sitting in the back row and they're making a note, right? So next year, the software has got better software to support eye tests for diabetics. And that was interesting to watch. You know, that's market forces in action. Doctors were paying with their own money for software, so the developers were working hard to make it better all the time. So there is an issue now in that in England as well, the government is trying to push doctors to use centrally prescribed systems basically from two different suppliers. And there is a serious concern that over time, these systems will become less capable than systems that you buy on the open market. So, what happens to privacy once you start centralizing systems? Well, the first skirmish happened in Iceland 15 years ago because there was a startup called Decode, was started by um, an Icelandic doctor who had been working in Boston called Kari Stephenson. And he raised some money and went to the Icelandic government with a proposition. He said, 
you let me put in a centralized database for all medical records in Iceland and let me sell anonymized information of the Icelandic population to a Swiss drug company, Roche, and in return you will get a free medical record service. So this looked like a very, very good deal to the government of Iceland. And the Prime Minister of Iceland, David Odson, had actually been at school with Carrie Stephenson. Um, and um, so the, the deal was done, the law was passed. Um, but because of human rights law, there had to be an opt-out for patients who didn't want to take part. And the Icelandic Medical Association got very annoyed at this, and they ran a campaign whereby when you went into a doctor's office in Iceland, there'd be a pile of leaflets and perhaps a poster saying, you know, protect your privacy, opt out of the evil central database now. And um, so they got 11% of the population to opt out. And eventually the thing went to the Icelandic Supreme Court. Now, Iceland is a member of the Council of Europe, same as Britain and other EU countries. And so they enforce the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and the Icelandic Supreme Court found that if you're going to run a system like this, it should be opt-in rather than opt-out. And with that, the Icelandic scheme collapsed and the decode company went bankrupt. So that was, if you like, the first skirmish in this war. And we thought that that was perhaps good news for privacy, um, in that the court, for once, had uh, stood up for the individual. Now, some years after that, in 2010, we had the European Court on Human Rights in Strasbourg um, was asked to rule on medical privacy. And this is an interesting case, the I v Finland case. Ms. I, who's known only by her initial, was a nurse in Helsinki, and she was HIV positive. Now, at the Helsinki University Hospital, um, the systems let all the clinicians, that is, all the doctors and all the nurses, see the records of all the patients. And this meant that the other nurses could see that this lady was HIV positive, and so they, they shunned her socially and basically handed her out of her job. So she sued for compensation for wrongful dismissal, and the court in Helsinki said, no, nope, the government made regulations saying this is how it's to be, so that's your tough luck. So she went to Strasbourg and appealed under European human rights law because Section 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights means that we have got a right to privacy, which can be overridden um, only um, by process of law um, for purposes that are necessary in a democratic society and are proportionate. And so the European Court um, found that people within the court's jurisdiction, that is the EU plus the other Council of Europe nations, are entitled to restrict our personal health information to those clinicians, those doctors and nurses who are directly involved in treating us. Now, from the point of view of privacy campaigners, this is a significant result. But of course, from the point of view of health ministries, it's an extreme inconvenience. And from the point of view of people selling big um, health database systems, it is an embarrassment. So let's have a look at the recent UK history. In 2002, then Prime Minister Tony Blair ordered a national programme for IT because he had just been re-elected to a second term as Prime Minister. He wanted to invest more money in healthcare and he wanted a big flagship project that would signal the government's commitment to making the health system better. And so what they decided to do rather than reforming the health system, which would come up against opposition from doctors, nurses, and health unions, was simply to change the computer systems. So the idea was that they would replace all the IT systems with standard ones, giving everybody a single electronic health record and access to everyone with a need to know. And we thought, wait, hang on a minute. Does this mean that all the 800,000 or so people who work for Britain's health system be able to access my record. But hey, this went ahead anyway. We didn't yet have the judgment in the Helsinki case. And over the years, it became apparent that this was one of those big public sector IT disasters. Nothing worked and it wasn't anybody's fault. 
One after another, the smart contractors got out. Sorry. Um, and that left one or two contractors at the end who were struggling to make new systems work without really having understood how complex health was. And so um, there were various tussles here. Um, a number of computer science professors, including me, wrote to the Secretary of State for Health saying, you need an independent review of this. No, they said, we'll get it working real soon now. And up until the 2010 election, um, where Labour was replaced with the Conservatives, the priority for the politicians was not to have to admit that the NHS IT project had failed. Now, since then, they have announced that the project has been discontinued, but actually the same contractors are in place and the same mess is continuing in many ways. So this is perhaps the biggest IT failure, um, at least in the unclassified civilian part of the world that we know of, Perhaps something like five billion or eight billion or so pounds have been wasted on computer systems, which held up development in the UK of health IT for many years, and which also laid waste to much of our domestic industry of people who were producing health IT systems, because with only five big contractors, everybody else had to become a subcontractor, and companies that previously had been selling administrative systems to hospitals either had to turn to exporting or become subcontractors. So this, this was a big deal for Britain's IT industry. One of the reasons that, you know, as computer science people, we had to pay some attention to it. But despite the overall failure, a number of things did get fielded. Over half of family doctor systems are now hosted, as they call it in, in the NHS. That means in the cloud so that instead of the doctor having the records in his own PC in his surgery, they're sitting on a server operated by BT. And this means that, in effect, the control of the records and the control of the software has passed from the doctor to the minister. We also had significant problems with access control. So... What the government decided to do was to have role-based access control, whereby if your role requires access to a patient record, you will have access to that record, provided you have a relationship with the patient. Now, they were warned in advance that this wasn't fine-grained enough control, but they didn't want to listen. So what happened is that you find that receptionists in hospitals ended up being able to read psychiatric case notes of all patients. Why? Because doctrine said there should be a single electronic health record rather than a separate general medical record and psychiatric record. Okay. The receptionist needs access to the record so that she can receive the patient so that she knows who's standing in front of her and which doctor the patient is going to see. And the patient has got a relationship with the receptionist because, you know, they're there in the same space. So logically, there is no way that you can stop the receptionist having access to the psychiatric case notes if you built the access control system in this way. But again, the systems were built before people had done a sufficiently careful requirements analysis of precisely what sort of security policy would be required to reflect the relationships of trust that people expect in um, the relationships of their hospital. Here's a second example. The government decided to build a centralised address book for all patients in the NHS. This is called PDS, the Population Demographic Service. And it's got your name, your address, your postcode, your phone number, your mobile phone number, your password for accessing online health services. So if you phone up, they can ask you for your password, right? And it's also got an audit trail so they can tell who had access to it. And so whenever you go to a hotel, uh, to a hospital in the UK, you go to reception, they'll say, who are you? Ross Anderson, what's your date of birth? 15956. Oh yes, you're seeing Dr. Swan, aren't you? So they have access PDS. This means that hundreds of thousands of people in the UK need access to PDS. Okay. And this means you have hundreds of thousands of people who have access to everybody's um, ex-directory phone numbers, to their addresses, even if they are potential victims, 
And so we have this case of a, a woman who had divorced a violent husband, and he traced her to her new address and turned up and assaulted her and broke her arm. And he managed to do this simply because his aunt worked in a hospital. Not in any hospital where his ex-wife had been treated, but just in any random hospital. So in effect, this destroyed address privacy in the UK. And it creates problems potentially for people in witness protection programs, for celebrities, for people in intelligence services, and so on and so forth. But again, people didn't stop and think about it at the time because this was a big bang project that had to be done quickly before the next election. Nothing could be allowed to get in the way. It couldn't be piloted slowly and, and built up incrementally over time. Another example of what went wrong is that in Scotland, we had something called the emergency care record system. Now, this consists of a summary of your GP record. It is your prescriptions, um, your allergies, and one or two things like that. And the idea is that they're available to the ambulance man if they you know, come and um, collect you following an emergency call. And again, this was carelessly designed. And so this was turned on two years ago. And then there was a doctor in Montrose went and looked at the medical records of um, the Prime Minister, of the First Minister of Scotland, at famous sports people, um, at a good-looking young lady who is a newsreader in BBC Scotland. And there was a big scandal. But again, nothing got done, because this is now a fielded system, and how can you take it away? And then what happens is that the scope of the system creeps. Once you have everybody's medical records available on a server, lots of other people want access to it. So in Oxford, for example, where all the GPs have, almost all the GPs have their records hosted, they started to give record access to social workers because, after all, medical care and social care work hand in hand, especially when caring for the, the young and for the very old. But again, what they found was that this had bad side effects um, because women who were suffering from postnatal depression, for example, didn't want to tell this to the GP, especially if they're from poorer families because they're worried that perhaps the social workers um, might want to take their babies into care. And again, um, the alarm on this was raised by various pregnancy charities, but again, the system is in. What can we do about it now? Well, what we did manage to do is after the 2010 election, we persuaded, various lobbyists persuaded, um, the government to abandon a proposed database on all children that would have pulled together medical data, school data, um, drug abuse data, police data, probation office data, and so on. And there was actually a proper rev review of this by Irene Munro, who's a professor of social work at LSE. Um, but despite that having been officially killed three years ago, there is now an attempt to start it again. The drive to create ever bigger databases and to sell them on the basis of potential benefit to other stakeholders always seems to be stronger than the willingness to stop and think about the problems that you could have in real cases. What's public opinion about this? Well, public opinion in Britain is much the same as in America or Australia, um, and it's been much the same for 30 years since people have been doing surveys. And basically, um, lots of people will allow access to their records for research if they're asked, but most people are against the idea that there will be a central database which will give access to researchers with no possibility of opting out. So with no opt-out, 17% tend to oppose and 36% strongly oppose. So that's, you know, a majority who are not in favour of that. And this has been stable for a long time. There are other interesting twists in this. For example, one of the more vocal opponents of a mandatory central research database is the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church takes the view that women must have the right to forbid their medical data being used in research on abortion, on contraception, on stem cell work. And so this is an interesting case where a privacy argument is being made 
not for privacy reasons, but for theological reasons. And perhaps if these issues become salient in Israel, um, then given um, views of um, Orthodox Jews, of more hardline Muslims, and of course, not just Catholics, but Orthodox bishops, things like this could become a significant issue here. So, so much for the problems with securing information um, at the first level, where you're securing information that you're actually using in your hospital or in your surgery. These problems, we think, can be solved um, given goodwill and good engineering, careful requirement specification, and attention to the problems of scale. Where things become really difficult is with secondary uses. Now, people mostly talk about uses in medical research, but at least as important in political terms are uses in terms of controlling the costs of a health service. Um, looking, for example, at the costs of different surgical teams, looking, for example, at the costs of different treatments, um, because these end up steering policy in ways that a whole lot of people don't like. So the secondary use situation in Britain is that in January 2011, David Cameron set out a policy that he would make anonymized medical information available to researchers, both academic and commercial, but with an opt-out. Again, this is to keep them legal with the IV Finland case in the European Court on Human Rights. And what the research community want is that if I am, say, for example, a professor of kidney medicine, then I want to have on my laptop the records in ev of everybody in Britain who's ever had a kidney diagnosis, not just those people in dialysis, but even people who once you know, felt a bit of pain here. I want to be able to you know, get up at three in the morning with a bright idea and you know, um, do some SQL queries and confirm the latest hypothesis that I've got without having to mess around going to an ethics committee, going to a central database, waiting in line, handing in my job, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, really convenient if you can have you know, millions and millions of records sitting on your laptop. And this is now starting to happen. And so three years ago, we had a problem where such a laptop was stolen in London from a hospital with um, over 8 million people's so-called anonymized records, although these records did contain their postcode and their date of birth, so you could track, track, track back to patients if you wanted. Now, none of these records have ever turned up on the black market, so we hope that this laptop was just stolen by a drug addict who then sold it for $50 to some drug dealer who then reformatted the hard disk and sold it on eBay. You know, maybe we were lucky. <laughs> but <laughs> if this goes on, then sooner or later, somebody is going to leave a laptop on a train or a plane, and it's going to end up on WikiLeaks or Pastebin or somewhere like that. And September last year, we had a gateway went live uh, for selling anonymized health information, still mostly from secondary care. And on our blog, I blogged a couple of weeks ago that the company in America is now advertising that they have got 50 million people's records available for researchers, if you will partner with them. And from March 2014, we are going to have a system which similarly collects information from GPs in the UK. So the question of how do we anonymize medical records is a really important one. And this is um, a fascinating topic with lots of computer science angles. Now, the guy who's in favor of anonymization is this guy, Mark Walport. He's just been made our government chief scientist. You know, he has an almost religious belief in the power of anonymization. So let me try and put forward some heresy. Now, the study of statistical security, or um, disclosure control, or inference control, started about 1980 with the US Census. Before that, the US Census just published aggregate totals plus occasional sample return forms that had been manually redacted. But from 1980, they decided to make the results of the census available online to curious people. And so they worked out a scheme for doing this that they hoped would preserve privacy. And one lady who was working on this, Dorothy Denning, said, now hang on a minute. She said to her boss, I reckon I could work out your salary from the information that we're proposing to make public. Nah, he said, no way, couldn't do it. So she did it. And um, she became a famous computer science academic and wrote a book 
and suddenly there were conferences on database security and people are proving theorems about inference control. And there was a great um, spike of this work in the early 1980s. And let me give you some of the flavor of it. So the first thing that you might try and do is say, we will only answer a query if it is made on a minimum number of people. So in New Zealand, they have got a, a database of all the medical records of everybody in the country. And a query can only be done if it will be answered with respect to six or more records. So you can't get queries on individual records. Now the problem, as Dorothy Denning figured out 30 years ago, is this. Can you find a series of queries that will reveal a sensitive statistic? For example, in the computer lab at Cambridge, we have 10 full professors, of whom one, Anne Corpstake, is a woman. Right? Full professors at Cambridge are eligible to apply for bonuses because of excellence in research and success in fundraising and so on, and these bonuses are confidential. So if I want to find out what Anne's bonus is, what I do is I ask average salary or professors in the computer lab. That's something that should be available under freedom of information, no? Average salary male professors, well nine is greater than six, so if we're using the New Zealand rule then of course this will be disclosed. And then with basic arithmetic I can work out what Anne's salary is. But it can be even more subtle than that. For example, I could ask average salary all non-professors, you know, all junior academic staff, and average salary for all female junior academic staff. And then somebody would have to be pretty smart to figure out that what I was actually after was Anne's salary. Now, one of the things that they discovered in the early 1980s is that under reasonable assumptions, there are trackers for most sensitive statistics. So this is a very general, powerful attack um, if you assume that the data are in some sense normal. And so what they do in New Zealand is that they don't let just anybody have access to this database. There's only half a dozen people who have got the necessary security clearance to do it. Right? You, you've basically got to be a security cleared medical statistician. And if a, an ordinary researcher wants to use the database, they have to submit the, the query and basically wait for a week while the guy gets around to doing the query and releasing the results. And of course, this is a bit inconvenient, but it's fairly secure. Here's an example from a case that we actually dealt with. There was a company, IMS Health, which wanted to collect prescribing information from doctors' surgeries and sell it to drug companies so they could work out how, how much commission to pay their sales representatives. Okay? So what they wanted to do was to get anonymized information which would show how much the prescriptions for tranquilizers, for example, had moved in favor of Glaxo and against Roche in some particular region where you had one sales representative. Yes? I want, is it okay to ask now? Or should sure. About the previous thing, even if a human uh, mediates these queries, I could still implement your strategy, right? Especially if there are two people working in the statistics department. I ask, you know, average salary of professors, go to the other person, ask a week later the average of male professors. Exactly so. Okay. So if you're going to do this properly, your machine becomes stateful. You have to keep a track, a track of who's asked what. Mm -hmm. And then you may make assumptions about collusion or non-collusion. Um, and in fact, um, there's more recent work which shows that there are various ways in which you can allocate a, a privacy budget to a database. And once that privacy budget is used up, then you can't make any more queries. As Cynthia Dwork and colleagues have done that. The problem with that is you can never sell this to the ministry because they go and spend a billion pounds making this database and they tell all the voters that this will make the voters live forever and save the money too. And suddenly after three weeks of operation, the information commissioner stands up and says, sorry, I'm blowing up the database now because you've expired your privacy budget. This is not going to be very attractive to government. So what happened in this case was interesting because the doctors themselves didn't want to be identified in these statistics because they didn't want to get harassed by the sales representatives. So the doctors were prepared to go along with this only provide, provided not just patients but also doctors would have privacy from analysis. 
So the first design of the system they came up with said, well, what we'll do is put in the number of prescriptions of each type of drug per doctor per week. So if you have 30 doctors in Cambridge, you'd have doctor 1 through doctor 30, and this might be the number of prescriptions that they had written for Glaxo's uh, antidepressants um, in any one week. <coughs> and then we looked at this and we said, now hang on a minute, if I'm the sales representative for Glaxo in Cambridge, I'll be able to look at this and say, hey, Doctor 2 must be Susan Smith at the Guildhall practice because she went skiing last week in the third week in January. Oops, they said. And so they decided um, that, in, that, that, in, that instead of giving absolute numbers of prescriptions, you'd have to give percentages of market share. And we looked at other attacks, and then we figured that you had to jiggle the, the rows uh, backwards and forwards slightly so that you had um, you know, a, a standard error of a few weeks introduced into it and so on and so forth. So after a bit of work, we come up with a system which actually um, passed a test of litigation because the Department of Health sued in order to stop them um, running this system for various policy reasons, but the High Court decided in the end that the privacy design was sound. The problem is that if you are going to use anonymity in this way, you are more or less tied to a fairly specific design up front, and if you try and extend it later, you can break your anonymity quite spectacularly. In fact, this system, although it's been running for over 10 years, is now under threat because the Department of Health has started to build its own system for the same purpose, but which de-identifies the data in a slightly different way. So there's a risk that by combining the two anonymous data sets, you could say, aha, Dr. Smith hasn't been prescri prescribing enough X, Y, Z. So this is how hard it is to do it properly. So there are various other things you can do. I just mentioned perturbation. Another thing is trimming. You sometimes get some fairly large outliers in statistical data sets. Um, for example, um, the richest man in Cambridge, Michael Marshall, who owns the airfield, um, lives in the little village of Swaffham um, Prior to the east of Cambridge. So if you wanted to find out what his income is from the census returns, you would look at the average income of people in Swaffham Prior and subtract the average income of Swaffham Bulbeck, the village next door. And again, you're back to the problem that we, we had earlier. So if you have got a whole lot of people who are earning 50,000 a year and one guy who earns 50 million a year, you'd better take that out of the statistics and do that on a purely national basis. So there's all sorts of other things that you've got to look at. And there are some quite cool tricks that people have come up with over the years. For example, there's random sampling. In random sampling, what you basically do is you take the input query and you feed it into a, a keyed cryptographic hash function and you get a, some, some random string out which then tells you which of the records you should use to answer that particular query. So successive queries are answered with respect to different subsets of records in a way that an attacker can't predict. And in some circumstances, that can give you some real value for money. I mentioned the modern theory. Um, Cynthia Dwork and others have developed differential privacy. And here they try and extend provable security notions to inference control. What's the maximum amount of information you can get out of a database without revealing private information? And as with provable security generally, uh, you know, this turns out to be hard. You know, one-time pad isn't practical in most applications, and differential privacy isn't practical um, in most real database problems either. Because there's a big problem which is difficult to deal with with purely mathematical tools. Here's another real-life example. Back in 1996, we gave a briefing to um, politicians of the Labour Party before the election that they won in 97 to make a government. And they said, well, why is it that we can't just anonymize everything? And I said, well, suppose you've got a medical database that's got no names and addresses, but where you can make the sort of rich queries that researchers want to make, such as, show me all 42-year-old women with nine-year-old daughters who are both suffer from psoriasis. Okay? This was Anne Campbell, the MP for Cambridge. Public information. So, again, how you have to think of a medical record is it some information about you that's public and some information about you that may be sensitive. Or again, Gordon Brown. He lost his right eye playing rugby on a known day in 1972. 
you know, and not many people lose their right eye playing rugby on any particular day. So a fact like that is sufficient to pull one patient out of the entire population of Britain. And when you start adding demographic and family uh, data, uh, it gets worse still. When you get active attacks, it's even worse still. Here's an example of an active attack. When we were discussing in Iceland whether the proposed privacy was good enough, suppose you want to find out whether a particular politician, for example, ever got treated for, say, alcohol abuse, which is the sensitive thing in Iceland. So what you do is this. The system they had in Iceland was such that if a medical record was created, a copy would be sent to the Iceland Privacy Commissioner, who would remove the name, address, and so on, and replace them with an encrypted value of the social security number, encrypted using a key that only the information commissioner had. Okay, so they had hardware set up, server in his office, and so on, and this was all supposed to be bulletproof. So what I do is I find an unattended te terminal in a hospital, and look, Reykjavik Hospital is like any other hospital, you can just wander in. Um, and I write out a prescription for, say, aspirin for the target. And then my collaborator working on the medical research side sees, aha, a prescription for aspirin just turned up. So the pseudonym of the Prime Minister is this hex string. How do you go about excluding active, at active attacks? The answer is it's really, really hard. Hey, and as for the social network stuff, once you start putting all your friends on your Like the Hospital website, then there's a serious issue. Now, this is something that computer scientists have been developing for basically the last 30 years. And until about three years ago, it was very, very difficult to get this across to lawyers because they would see papers and they were all full of mathematics and they'd say, surely this can't be important. But then there's a law prof in uh, Colorado called Paul Ohm, wrote a paper in lawyer language and got it published in a law journal, um, Broken Promises of Privacy, which sets out all these problems. And since then, at least in the USA, it's becoming rather hard to deny that there is a problem. Now, um, I'm not going to go into at great length the problems that we've had with opt-out mechanisms. I'll mention briefly a big tussle in Europe is that there has been a huge lobbying fight over a data protection regulation that was supposed to upgrade and harmonize data protection law for the whole of Europe. This became the most heavily lobbied piece of legislation ever in the European Parliament with 3,000 attempted amendments and it now looks like it will be um, basically put on hold until after the next European election in March next year, May next year. So here's the research challenge. What happens when we add DNA? Now in Iceland, they proposed to be able to link medical records to sequence data and um, family trees and so on where these were available. And that was particularly interesting in Iceland because it's descended from a small founder population and they have good, good genealogical records. But now, because of the falling cost of DNA sequencing, there is a temptation to try and do this everywhere else as well. And in Britain, we now have a project which is called the 100,000 Genomes Project, which, as it says, is government money to sequence 100,000 patients' genomes. And this is both for clinical care and also for research. There are some cases in clinical care where it can be very, very good to have genetic tests. If you get lung cancer, for example, about 10% of people have a type that can be treated with a certain drug. So you definitely want to have that test to see if that's um, useful in your case. And so our government has decided that all these data will be centralized. And if you don't con consent to unlimited use of your data and your records in research, then you won't get treatment. So if you're a Catholic woman and you have a religious objection to your records um, being used in research, then you just better not catch lung cancer while you're in Britain, right? <laughs> and we can see this causing certain ethical problems in the future. Also, it had been proposed that the sequence data would be shared with about two dozen international partners, including the American firm 23andMe, um, 
run by the farmer Mrs Bryn. And the FDA last week just stopped 23 and Me from offering health advice to new customers because they reckoned their privacy controls weren't good enough. So what are we doing? In the UK we've got a Nuffield Bioethics Council inquiry, um, which I'm involved with, where we're getting together a number of computer scientists, medics, people who do philosophy of ethics and so on, and trying to figure out what you can do in a world where there is DNA in play as well as simple uh, medical record information. Because of course, if I sequence your DNA, I, know, I don't just know about you, I know about your brothers, sisters, your parents. It leaks all sorts of family information. And if there is um, something in your family that some people would perhaps rather not know about, some people, for example, just don't want to know whether they're going to get Huntington's disease because it would make them too depressed to know that they will eventually get sick from it, then there are very serious ethical issues around that. How do you build that in when you're designing systems? There's also a question of when is the public going to start getting worried about this? Because up until now, um, we've had the privacy paradox, which is that if you ask a hundred people on the street in London or in New York or in Sydney whether they um, care for privacy, a third will say, not at all, I've got nothing to hide, nothing to fear, and a third will say, I won't tell you anything about me, go away, and the third in the middle will be privacy pragmatists who will trade some information in return for some services. But as Google and Facebook and others have found out, most people will actually trade information for services if it's not made that obvious that this trade is being done. So why do people say one thing and do another? And this gets us into the field of the behavioral economics of privacy um, because people don't act entirely rationally about this because of various psychological heuristics and biases, which my colleague Alessandro Acisti at CMU has been looking at and he finds, for example, um, that he um, has an experiment where he gets a group of people and he gets them to answer a questionnaire. And the questionnaire contains all sorts of embarrassing questions. Did you ever cheat at an exam? Did you ever cheat on a partner? Did you ever smoke dope? And so on. And he's interested in how many of these questions the student will answer before they say, you know, hang on a minute, this is too much, I'm not going to answer any more questions. So what he does is he runs this experiment on a group of students at Carnegie Mellon in a neutral setting where the web page says Carnegie Mellon University Department of Decision Sciences. And they answer a certain number of questions. Then that's the control group. For the second group, he gave them strong assurance privacy, saying, we will not record your IP address, we will encrypt your answer with 2568-bit AES, and so on and so forth. And he then measures what their privacy preference is now. What do you think the result will be? Will they give more information or less? If they're, yes. they're more, uh, less. A, lot, a lot less, because you made them think about privacy. And then he does a third experiment where the students are taken to a website which isn't even on campus. It's howbadareyou.com, and there's, on the front of the website, there's a little red devil with horns and a tail saying, go, go on, show us how bad you are. <laughs> and the students confess to everything. <laughs> so this gives us a real insight into how Google, Facebook, and others, and even our own health service are doing this. They avoid making privacy salient. But eventually, over time, people start to realize that there is a privacy oh. issue, and in Alessandro's observations on Facebook, he's observed that the number of people who set privacy settings continuously increases. Because every year or two, Facebook resets all the privacy settings. You know, once enough people have opted out of ads, then more people set the privacy settings and they reset it, and still more people set the privacy settings. And the trend line, despite everything that Facebook can do, is upwards. So part of the answer to why people say they value privacy but act differently is that it's not made salient. Uh, and part of the answer is that it takes people time to learn. Not everybody understands computers as, as, as well as you know, people in this room do. And then there's the question of whether we have passed the point of peak indifference, particularly with all the revelations 
uh, coming from Edward Snowden all the time. And then there's a big question, will there eventually be some kind of scandal that changes public attitudes? This is what we've seen in the UK, for example, with attitudes towards tissue samples in hospitals. For many years, hospitals just kept samples of tissues that they'd taken from you during an operation or from dead people during autopsy. If they thought they were interesting, they just put them in a jar and put them on the shelf. Uh, this became public at a hospital called Alder Hay, where one of the pathologists had a big private collection of body parts. There was public outrage, and now all of a sudden this is very heavily regulated. So there is a risk, I think, that eventually there will be some scandal where a psychiatrist leaves a laptop on a train with information on everybody in Britain, or perhaps everybody in Israel, who's ever had a diagnosis for depression. And then suddenly there is such a public outcry that we end up having to redo all the systems on which the health service depends. So that's the problem of clinical systems. It's a problem of both safety and privacy. And um, hey, um, attitudes in the UK are beginning to change. People are beginning to pay attention. And I'd be very interested in hearing from you what the attitudes are like in Israel. And this is this morning's Daily Mail. Your medical notes aren't private now. So that's hot off the press. This is beginning to bubble up the news agenda. And um, it's not something that's going to go away. So. So how is it here? Hmm. Questions? Hmm. Hello. Hey. The problem of obvious is that we have a kind of balance between the, the, the issues of privacy and the issues of, uh, uh, of uh, healthcare. Yeah. Do you have any solutions? Um, well, in the mid-1990s, I did some work with the British Medical Association on how you can protect privacy um, in the direct care setting. So we came up with a, a security policy. It was put in at three hospitals. Um, the sort of thing is that you get um, better designed rules such that any nurse can access the record of any patient who has been on her ward for the previous 90 days. Right? So you need finer grained access controls and you need to be more aware of how the workflow passes through a real hospital. Right? You can't just take off the shelf um, access controls from packaged software and hope that they'll work. So the direct care setting we can fix. In the setting of secondary uses, um, I think that allowing people good opt-outs um, might be the way to fix this if they were robust. Now, the problem is something that I um, kind of skipped over um, for a shortage of time, that we have had a number of cycles in the UK which are like the Facebook cycles of re resetting your privacy things every so often. So, for example, in 2008-2009, the NHS in England tried to set up a summary care record like the emergency care record in Scotland and let people opt out, about 700,000 people did. In March of this year, when the, the new data upload from GPs was announced, the Secretary of State first said that the old opt-outs would be respected. And then in the middle of this year, one of his officials went and said, no, you're, you're going to have to opt out all over again, I'm sorry. The old opt-outs aren't good enough. Right? So the fact is the government isn't playing in a straight and honest way with people, any more than Mark Zuckerberg is when he keeps on redesigning privacy controls in Facebook. And so this short-sighted greed on the part of officials is in the long term going to undermine and abolish trust. Now, if, if the government were capable, they would have opt-outs that really work, and then they would really respect them, and then perhaps one or two percent of people would opt out, you know, privacy freaks, the ultra-religious, and so on, and, um, and then that would be okay. But because they don't play it honestly, I think it's, it's just going to keep on mounting. I'm not sure whether the opt-out option is sufficient because many people just are not aware of the, of, of the possibility and also 
sometimes only in, in retrospect you realize that uh, that that's uh, your psychiatrist. You go, you have a, you're depressed. You go to a psychiatrist. The last thing you think about is to opt out of some kind of uh, uh, of record crawling, and then it's in, and then the moment your record is in the database, it's impossible to remove it. Well, this is um, from today's Guardian. When you discover that a paraplegic Canadian woman was denied entry to the USA after a border guard accessed a database that revealed she'd once been suicidally depressed, it's easy to see how you or someone you love might suffer far-reaching consequences, even from accurate data used for the purpose uh, for which it was intended, uh, other than that from which it was intended. Sorry, I must have miscopied that. So again, that is from this morning's Guardian. And the, it, it, there's going to be a continued series of stories like this, both from the healthcare world and the Snowden world and other worlds, which over time will make people sensitive. How do you deal with what happens in the meantime, where people carelessly forget to manage their privacy settings? I don't know. It, it, it might be great to go to a world where people had to opt in. Perhaps only Germany will do that. mechanism by which you know you are the only one authorized to give the key for something you can set you know personally your your defaults for that but by law no repository can hold unencrypted uh, information and uh, basically every uh, query has to ask um, you know permission of, for every individual thing but just have a system that makes it a little bit easier and to mechanize just the key management well, if the person paying for the records were me, then I might buy a system like that. Although it's not quite that simple, um, because what happens if I'm unconscious and so on. You can deal with stuff like that. We already in the UK use patient-held re records for pregnancy, right? So if a woman is pregnant, we give her a big red folder with all her notes in it, because you never know when a woman is suddenly going to start to give birth. You can't rely on it being at the hospital where she had her antenatal checks. So that works fine. And there's some countries like Zambia where um, records are, are patient held. And again, that works fine. Um, but the problem is the records are not being bought by the patient, right? Because patients don't care about records, Google Health, etc. They're being bought in effect by the providers. And in countries like Britain, where we've got state health provision, what's happened over time is that this is inexorably control has passed from the doctors to central government. And the dynamic behind that is that there's a power struggle between doctors and civil servants over control of the health service. And the civil servants believe that if they control all the information, they will be able to manage the doctors better. No, so I'm saying by law, neither should have control. It's the citizen. And you know, maybe you get whatever, I don't know, half a pound if you are willing for the next half year to give access. I mean, I want to make it a key management issue. There is, there is a database of keys, you know, passwords, whatever. And, uh, you know, no one holds, you're the only one forever, uh, uh, except for very extreme situations, you know, unconsciousness, uh, whatever, psychiatric disabilities, things like that. But by default, um, you have to, at least implicitly, give your consent to any use of your records. And by law, the big uh, database, whatever, controllers can never, you know, are not, never allowed to hold it. Uh, I mean, of course, they can decrypt once and keep it forever, but this would be, let's say, illegal, and then big players can't do it. Well, hey, um, the question is, who makes the laws, and what's the process by which law is made? And we've seen the process by which law is made in Brussels, and it's very, very dirty. Hey, there's one of the neatest cryptographic, well, cri <coughs> cryptographer ideas I heard from this came from Gus Simmons, you know, who invented the, the football that's carried around behind the US president. So he knows a thing or two about cryptography. There's old Gus. And he said, well, how you should sort this out in a place like America is that anybody who looks at a patient's record and doesn't then submit an invoice is a crook, right? Because in America, everything is fee for service, right? You don't pay, you don't get treated. And so if I put in, if, if I read your record and don't then submit an invoice for $70 for thinking about your case, then I should just be automatically arrested. 
And that way, you align the patient's interest in privacy with the hospital's interest in maximizing its revenue. Yeah. Uh, there is a place in the world where the information uh, moves to, to data, or they, they are planning a, a good plan how to do it correctly, uh, and uh, do it as a healthy procedure, not as the UK when it's like the kids going to uh, around against time? Well, there are places where they do it better than the UK, and um, one of, one of the best is possibly Germany, where they have got privacy laws built into the Constitution. Um, um, there are also reasonable systems in the Netherlands and Sweden, uh, because there the provision of healthcare is decentralized. So in Sweden, for example, you don't have a national health service. You have 12 county health services and three municipal health services. So this health is provided by local government, and the ministry in Stockholm just acts as the regulator. So the regulator then basically approves um, as fit for purpose the software that can then be bought by individual doctors or healthcare providers. In addition to that, in smaller countries in Europe, um, they tend to abide more by international standards rather than trying to build all their own systems. Because if you're a small country like Belgium or Finland, you're not going to be able to support um, you know, all of the software industries you need to provide everything that a hospital needs. And therefore, there's a lot of standardization work done in SEND TC251 on what standard messages should be, for example, to send a pathology results message from a hospital to a doctor or to send an electronic prescribing message from a doctor to a pharmacist. And where you have got this decentralized approach, th things seem to go a lot better. Uh -huh. This is uh, detecting your medical status according to your fingerprints. And the government is going to start a new, uh, non optional, actually compulsory service, a medical service of collecting everybody's fingerprints and running uh, medical algorithms on them. And you try to fight this uh, biometric data. Uh, and you try to explain it to people. Some people say, well, I have nothing to report. Why? The main problem is that actually the government is after those who claim privacy is good and important. For example, we keep seeing the um, rap by the biometric uh, agency. They had a rapper doing a uh, battle of raps between uh, pro uh, database and anti database. And of course, the anti database was a very uh, ugly, unconcerned, uh, unsuccessful hacker. Um, but when it comes to medical, uh, medical information, there are actually some people claiming that this actually prevents um, innovation. And one of the problems that we do find out is that when you try to explain this to people dealing with medical research, they are like, yeah, I understand why you're worried with privacy, but you know, we're the good guys. Just give us the data and we promise to you that we're not going to abuse it. So this is part of the problem in, in Israel. Well, yes, medical exceptionalism is a well-known problem. Um, doctors think they're special because they earn more and because they get good grades to go to university and because, because they're helping people. And, um, and we see also the same mindset in Google and in the NSA and so on. We're the good guys, trust us. So what can you do? I don't know. Um, you know, this is a part of the political dynamic that we as computer scientists will be living in perhaps for the next generation as society comes to terms with the fact that sensing is now so cheap it's almost free, communications and storage are now so cheap that they're almost free, and ultimately we have to take policy decisions about who gets what information. And that's going to be in, in a complex space with a lot of very powerful players with sharp elbows trying to get themselves positions that will sustain their business models. That information is helpful, or at least it's not abused. It's possibly oversold, um, but, um, you know, again, there's an argument about means and ends. And um, if you're a pure utilitarian, and, you know, you buy the, uh, the torture argument and all the rest of it, then, of course, you will buy the argument that 
hey, people can make money out of medical records, so let's nationalize them all and sell them off. No, it meant you know, finding mutations to cure cancer. You could also make money off of it, but maybe you couldn't find it. Well, my own view on this for what it's worth, having seen this for almost 20 years now, is that um, people who claim that they can make huge amounts of progress from vast mass of unstructured medical records are probably misleading themselves. And where people have been trying to do this properly, for example with UK Biobank, um, they went out and recruited several hundred thousand volunteers who volunteered to give full medical history, full access to their records and a blood sample. Right? And the idea is you wait 20 or 30 years until significantly many of these people have died. And then you go and look at the combinations of genes um, and other factors, epigenetics, proteomics, and so on, that are associated with various types of cancer and heart disease. Now, you can do that very much better if you have got a high-quality sample of the right size rather than just oceans of really, really dirty data, um, you know, with, with all sorts of um, sampling and other biases. Thank you. Uh, rest of the questions, you're welcome to come to us personally. It does remind you of the first day which will be more technical on uh, protocol failures and uh, you are most welcome. Thank you.